blessing, a uh, wonderful time of, of worship and singing some of those great songs. You know, um, if you've got your Bibles this morning, First Peter is where we're going to be at. We're beginning uh, a different series uh, this morning that is going to carry us for um, the next seven weeks, uh, starting next week. And this morning I want to lay some groundwork for that. Um, and I, I would love to talk to you about just the very subject that Jesus is precious. Um, and over, the, over the next several weeks, we're going to take uh, the seven I am statements that Jesus used in the book of John, and we're going to talk about those. So if you've got your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Put those things aside. Get those things out of your life. You don't want this to be a part of who you are. Certainly not as a Christ follower. He goes on to say in verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How many of you have tasted that the Lord is gracious? Amen. You've experienced that grace. You, you've tasted it. Well, you know what? He says if you have, then you need to be growing. You need to be in the Word of God. You need to be reading it. You need to be praying it into your life. And he goes on to say, coming to Him as a living stone, rejected indeed, indeed by men, but chosen by God. Now notice this word, and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house of a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 6. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. There's our word precious again. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And therefore to you who believe, he is precious. Yes, he is. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You know, as I've already mentioned, there are seven different I am statements in the book of John. Jesus gives every single time a description of himself with those words. Uh, he says, for I am, in John chapter 6, for instance, he says, I am the bread of life. You see, those seven statements are intended not so much to describe who He is, but they are intended to show us what He does and what He will do for you. So for the next seven weeks, we're going to consider those statements. We're going to look at how they impact our life. And, and in a very personal way, I, I want you to know how these statements are going to impact you. Now, before we get to this first I am statement of Jesus, I want to put a phrase in your mind. And I want you to chew on it. I want you to think about it. And the truth of it, here is the phrase, and we'll show you we've got some artwork done uh, uh, that was just finished up, and we'll put it before you next week. But, but here's the phrase, the, the I am changes who I am. The I am changes who I am. You know, I love when, uh, when Jesus was in the garden, John chapter 17, and then and we see the his prayer life with, with God the Father. We, we get to go into to a time where he is praying with God the Father. And then in John chapter 18, the you know Judas Iscariot does his dirty deed and he brings a, a bunch of folks with him to capture and seize Jesus Christ and, and to take him away to be crucified. And, and I love this. Over, over 300 people come with their clubs and their shields and they, they come to get Jesus and they can't even identify him. They, they don't know exactly who he is. And, uh, and they come up to Jesus as Judas Iscariot has led them there. And they look at Jesus in the eye and they say, Are you Jesus? And he answers them with two words. He says, I am. But what happens next? They fall to the ground, all of them. And, and they can't move, they can't get up. Until Jesus tells them they can get up. Those two words, very powerful words that Jesus used of himself. 
And we're going to look at, in particular, seven different ways, but, but let's just lay some groundwork today for what is to come in the coming weeks. You know, there was a medical missionary in China, and when someone would come to that medical missionary for treatment, he would always tell them the story of Jesus. You know, it's not always easy to tell the story of Jesus. Sometimes to some very difficult crowds. I know on Friday morning I was able to preach Miss Virginia's funeral. And I, I was so thankful for the order of the service. I had no idea um, how God would use the order of the service. Um, I'm so thankful for the order and how it was laid out uh, as I worked with the funeral home. But, but I went there and I preached this service. And as you know, Miss Virginia was just, wow, what a Christian she was. Love the Lord with all of her heart. And so it was such a joy to preach it. But, but I spoke on five minutes after you die. And, and, and I made this statement. I said, five minutes after you die is going to be the most amazing five minutes that you'll ever experience. Five minutes after you die will be the most sobering five minutes of your life. Five minutes after you die. And then I went on to speak about where you're going to be five minutes after you die. And in a nutshell, I said, you're either going to be in hell or heaven. And I spoke a little bit about, about hell. And boy, I could tell as I was speaking, there was so much resistance. I mean, you could tell. I don't know if it was the enemy working. I, I certainly knew people were very uncomfortable. And, uh, and so I continued to talk about hell just for a few moments and what that is like. And then I, I introduced heaven. And, and they wanted the song I can only imagine played. And so as I introduced heaven, I said, there's a song for you that I want you, the family wants you to listen to and enjoy. And I sat down. And when I sat down, I started praying. I was so thankful for that time to pray because I could feel just this resistance. It was so evident. And I began to pray and I began to ask God to tear down the walls of people's hearts. I, I began to ask God to help these people see their need for Jesus. And I got back up and finished talking about heaven and I was so thankful that the Lord answered and heard that prayer that about 15 or 17 of those came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for that. But, but listen, dear friend, I, I yeah, praise God for that. But you know what? One thing that I, that I was reminded of is when you talk about Jesus, man alive, people either come to Him or they're turned off by Him. Your church will either grow through it or they, your church will suffer for it. You know, one thing that I read even last night, that people are turning away from the church. A lot of the churches that are thriving are the churches, as Ms. Dreamer said, they're not preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. They're not preaching about sin. People don't want to hear these things today sometimes. They, they, want, they want a relationship with Jesus, but they want to stay in their sin. And the Bible clearly says you can't have it both ways. You can't either. You're going to love the Lord Jesus and turn from your sin and follow after Jesus or you're going to be a lover of this world. And, and you know what? You can't have it both ways. And there was a medical missionary that, that, you know what, man, he spoke about Jesus. Whoever came to him, he shared Jesus with them. And I, I love one morning, just before he opened up the clinic doors, there came a, a, mission, a, a, a woman to this missionary, an old lady that was laid with age and you could tell that she had traveled a long ways to get there. She had dust on her feet, dust on her clothes, dust on her face. And, and that morning he treated her as he treated every patient. He took time to tell her about Jesus. He helped meet a physical need, but he knew the greatest need that he was there to serve was her spiritual need. And he talked to her about Jesus. And that medical missionary told her these words. He said, as the rose opens to receive the rays of the noonday sun, he invited her to open up her heart to receive the Savior. And, and, and as he shared with her about Jesus, tears began to go down her cheeks. And she was so dusty and dirty, it, it left rose going down her face. And she cried. 
and opened up her heart to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. We know what several weeks later she came back to that missionary and knocked on his door and she said, you know what, I want to tell you something, sir. I have received Jesus Christ as my Savior. He lives in my heart. He has changed my life. I am happier than I have ever been. But sir, please tell me what his name is. I forgot his name. I accepted him, but I can't remember his name. And he grabbed her hands, he placed his hands on hers, and he looked her in the eyes, and he said, Ma'am, I want to tell you again, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Ma'am, his name is... And she repeated it with him. She said it when he said it. She said, Jesus. It put a smile on her face. Jesus. I tell you what, let's do a little exercise together. On the count of three, let's all of the saints name. Would you do that? One, two, three. Jesus. Oh, man. That was so fun. Let's do it again. All right? One, two, three. Jesus. Oh, what a name. There's not a name like the name of Jesus. Is there? It's a name that needs to be mentioned. It's a name that needs to be shared. It's a name that we should live for. Amen? The name of Jesus. You know, a little long, she heard that missionary story I just shared with you, and she wrote these words. Boy, they're certainly applicable. She said, there have been names that I have loved to hear. There are names that you probably love to hear. Right? If you date a pretty girl and someone mentions her name, oh, you just love that name, don't you? Huh? If you're married to someone and you're in love, Oh, you love to hear that name too, don't you? Yes. You know, what about the name of Jesus? She said, there are names that I love to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine as the name divine, the precious, precious name of Jesus. She went on to say, Jesus is the sweetest name I know and is just the same as His lovely name. And that's the reason why I love Him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Wow. Well, let me just tell you this. There were some things that were precious to Peter. As we began to... Uh, to look at, at this text today, uh, 1 Peter, we have it on the screen here for you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says that trials were precious to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, 19 says that the blood of Jesus was precious to Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says that Peter's faith was precious to Peter. 2 Peter 1, verse 4, it says the promises of God were precious to Peter to Peter. But I want you to notice our text here as Peter uses the word precious. In fact, three times Peter speaks of the Lord Jesus and he uses the word precious. Look at it with me, if you will, in verse 4. Peter said, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Look at verse 6. Therefore it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who receives him, notice these words, he who receives the Lord Jesus on him will by no means be put to shame. Oh man, I love that, don't you? <coughs> Whoever believes on the Lord Jesus will by no means put to shame. Well, look at verse 7. Therefore to you who believe, how many of you believe? How many of you know the Lord Jesus? Oh, dear friend, look at this verse. It says, therefore, to you who believe, He, Jesus, is precious. Amen. You know, it was like Peter was saying, you know what, I'd love to tell you what I think of Jesus. And he does. And it was like Peter was saying, you know what, Jesus is precious to me. He's so precious to me. Jesus is precious to me. It's as though the Lord, Peter is saying, you know what, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Master. Jesus is precious to me. You know, Peter said in verse 3, indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How many of you have experienced that grace. Huh? You experience that grace. You, you've been saved. And then you, like Peter, you have discovered that Jesus is gracious. You have found Jesus 
to be precious. You know, Peter's words, they're, they're full of feeling. They're full of meaning. He's pouring out his heart here in how he feels and how he loves Jesus. And Peter was saying, you know what? There is no one like Jesus. Amen. Can you say that? Hey, there's no one like Jesus. No one like Jesus. Well, what was he saying about Jesus? Let's look at it. Number one here, if you have your outline, what is Peter saying in this passage about Jesus? When he uses this word precious, I don't know if you write this down, dear friend. Number one, he is saying, dear friend, that Jesus is precious because Jesus has no rival. Jesus has no rival. There is no rival to Jesus. You know, when Peter said that Jesus was precious, dear friend, he was declaring simply that truth, that there is no one like Jesus. Jesus has no equal. Jesus has no rival. And of all of, of, all of the people that Peter had met, of all of the people that he encountered, every place he'd ever been, Peter is saying there is no one as good. There is no one as great. There is no one as glorious as Jesus. Can you say that? Charles Wesley wrote these words. He said, Jesus, the name high over all, in hell and earth and in sky, angels and men, before it fall and devils fear to fly. There is no name like Jesus. His name is high over all. And friend, let me tell you, he has no rival. I don't know if you've ever read this. It certainly isn't in the Bible, but, but it is a part of our history that dates us all the way back to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man that served on the Senate of the Roman Empire. His name was Publius Lentulus. And, uh, and he was, as I said, served the Roman Empire. He was an observer of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if he ever talked to Jesus. I don't know if he ever sat down and had a meal with Jesus. But he had observed Jesus. And he wrote these words about Jesus. He said, there appeared in, in these days a man of great virtue named Jesus Christ. Notice what he said. Who is yet among us. In other words, he's, he's writing these words and, and he's saying he's still here. He's still among us. He's still alive. His name is Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, of the Gentiles accepted, the Gentiles accept him for a prophet of truth. But his disciples call him the Son of God. He raises the dead and he cures all manner of disease. Doesn't matter what it is. In reproving, he is terrible. In admonishing, he is courteous and fair spoken. Pleasant in conversation mixed with gravity. It cannot be remembered that any have seen him laugh, but many have witnessed him weep. In proportion of body, most excellent. His hands and arms, Delectable to behold, in speaking very temperate, modest and wise, a man of singular beauty. But notice what he says here, I love it, surpassing the children of men. You know what he was saying? There's not a man that's ever lived like Jesus. Surpassing, And let me just say, he does surpass all of the children of men in every way and in all aspects. Dear friend, he is high over all. He is above all. Jesus has no rival. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 6, I love how Peter puts it. In John chapter 6, we studied a little, a little bit of this chapter in our marriage class this morning. You know, in John chapter 6, let me just bring you up to speed to verse 66, okay? In John chapter 6, let me give you the background, and then we'll read the text. Some of you are already reading the text. <laughs> let me give you the background. The background is Jesus has multitudes, multitudes of people following Him. They have seen Jesus take a little boy's lunch and feed the multitudes with it. They have witnessed Jesus do miracles. I mean, Jesus is building an incredible name for himself. 
People are following Jesus by the multitudes and Jesus looks at this massive crowd and He begins to talk to them and share with them and speak to them a very convicting, challenging message about loving even your enemies. How did they respond to it? Look at verse 66. It says, from that time after his message, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They walked away from Jesus to follow Jesus no more. And it goes on in verse 7. Then Jesus looks at the twelve and He asks them a question. He says, do you also want to go away? Do you want to do what everybody else is doing? I mean, hey, listen, it's going to cost you to follow me. If you want to go away, now's your chance. If you don't want to suffer for my name, if you don't want to live for what I'm telling you to live about, now is your chance to go away. Peter steps up. And I love verse 68. He says, But Simon Peter answered him, not thinking about everyone else, that, you know, the other 11 disciples, he thought of himself. And you know what? Peter said these words in response to Jesus saying, Do you want to go away? Peter said, You know what, Lord, to whom shall we go? And let me just pause for a moment because I believe behind the scenes, it's not clear in Scripture, but I do believe that in all of that, all of chapter 6, Peter looks at his life, he reassesses his life, he looks at what he used to be before Jesus, he looks at the multitudes as they walk away back out into the world. He thinks about fishing again. He thinks about being down on the boat. He thinks about drawing in the fish and trying to earn a living. He thinks about his wife. He thinks about his mom. He thinks about what his life was like before Jesus. All of this in the moment. And then he begins to think about what his life is like right now. As he's following Jesus. Yeah, it's tough sometimes. And, but he examines, is it worth it? And he answers the question, is it worth it? With a resounding, yes! And Peter puts his foot down as he stands up to answer Jesus. And he makes his mind up that it's not worth walking away. And he looks at his life as far as what he was like before Jesus. And he looks at his life after he has surrendered his life to follow Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And look at what he says in verse 69. And also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. He looks at Jesus and says, I don't want to go back. I've lived for the world. I've done life my own way. <laughs> I tried to make the best of my life that I possibly could. I, I mean, I, I've lived for myself. I, I've served this world. I, I've done all those things. And, and what i found is that, Jesus, you've given me a peace like nobody else. You are the redeemer of my sin. You are the one who can set me free from my past. Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, if, if we walk away from you, who are we going to turn to? What are we going to go back to? Lord, Lord, there's nowhere else I want to go. There's nowhere else I can go. You're the only one. You're the only one that's brought peace and joy in my life. 
Lord, I don't want to cover anyone else. I've been there and done that. How many of you have been there and done that? You lived for self and lived for this world and sought the pleasures of this world and now you turn to Jesus and you, you, you can kind of identify with Peter here. You can say, oh no. Lord, what would I turn to? You know, what would I live for? I mean, are you kidding? No, I'm not walking away from Jesus. Jesus, you're it. You alone have the words of eternal life. Do you know what? Jesus was very precious to Peter. You know, I think about Socrates. Socrates taught for 40 years. Plato taught for 50. Aristotle taught for 40. Some of, some of the greatest minds, the, 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 philo the greatest philosophers of antiquity, I mean, they taught a combined of 130 years. Jesus taught a total of three years. And yet they didn't have near the impact of Jesus. You know, Jesus painted no pictures. Can I tell you a little bit about Jesus today? Jesus painted no pictures, and yet some of the finest paintings ever painted by Raphael and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, the greatest artists, uh, uh, you know, the, the, those names that, that we're so familiar with, they received their greatest inspiration from Jesus. Jesus wrote no poetry, but Dante and Milton and scores of the world, world's greatest poets have been inspired and written their greatest works about Jesus. Jesus composed no music, and yet Handel and Beethoven and Bach reached their highest perfection of melody of the hymns and symphonies and oratories by composing praise about Jesus. You know, Jesus never wrote a book. But you know what? Hundreds of thousands of volumes have been written about Jesus. His words have been translated into more than 1,000 dialects and languages and handed out and passed out all around the world. Amen. He built no sanctuaries. But you know what? Churches have been built. Chapels have been built. Cathedrals have been built to worship Jesus. Jesus. He raised no armies. But listen, those who would fight for His truth and fight for His principles, dear friend, they are all over the world and can be numbered into the millions. Jesus, as we're going to be studying Him over the next few weeks, let me just tell you, He was born of a lowly mother without an earthly or human father reared in the meekness down in a little town called Nazareth. There was a man by the name of Philip who would later become one of his disciples. But Philip's brother came to him and said, Hey, you know what? The Messiah is here. The Old Testament prophesied one. He's down in Nazareth. And Philip looked at him and he said, Really? I don't know about this. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Hmm. Being reared in Nazareth, Jesus, without credentials, you know, dear friend, really from the religious leaders of his time, with no accreditation from any education, you know, from any school or university, he was hated by a, a lot of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was followed by the poor, the illiterate, and the downtrodden. He was called a son of the devil because of his own un unorthodox birth. Um, he was falsely accused of blasphemy and hierarchy because he used these words. If you've seen me, you've seen who? You've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen God. He was mocked by the crowds which had, had really pursued him in the days of his prosperity when the multitudes were following. His death was demanded by an angry mob, the multitude. He was condemned to die by crucifixion, buried in a rich man's borrowed tomb. It would seem that the world would hear the last of Jesus. But oh no. The pages of history are drenched with the blood of those who have given their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wars have been fought. Thrones have been abdicated because of Jesus throughout the centuries. His name, dear friend, has been the name that has stood above every single name. His life, His teachings, His, eth his ethics, 
Dear friend, they have changed, they have altered, and they have transformed individuals. Jesus has transformed communities. Jesus has transformed cities, nations, and even continents. 20 centuries have come and gone, and I am far within the mark when I say these words that, you know what, all of the armies that have ever marched, all of the navies that have ever sailed, and all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings who have ever reigned, put them all together, and I want to tell you this, they have not affected the life of man nearly as much as the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, dear friend, Jesus has no rival. He has no rival. I want you to notice number two here, He is precious because there is no Redeemer but Jesus. No Redeemer but Jesus. You know, Peter says that it is the act of believing which results in discovering the preciousness of Jesus. You know, Peter is saying, I, I believed, and because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the result of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is that Jesus is precious. Peter was declaring that Jesus was his redeemer. Peter declared this in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verses 18 and 19 with me, if you will. Peter says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless, aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers. But, but look at this. But with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, Peter found, dear friend, as many of us have found, and, and that is this, that no one, no one could, could find us in our sin and forgive us of our sin and free us from our sin, but Jesus. How many of you sit here today and you are so thankful that you are not what you used to be? Amen. Come on, folks, anybody. Maybe you need to think about that for a moment. Think about what you used to be before Jesus Christ. And I know sometimes our tendency as children of God is to look down our nose at someone else. Come on now, listen to me for a moment. To say, say words like this, how could they do such a thing? Dear friend, I want to tell you something about yourself. Whatever they did, you have the capability of doing far worse. Amen. I think about the words of David when he was praying about his own sin. And David, David said these words. He said, Lord, in, in, in prayer, he said, God, forgive me for my presumptuous sins. Well, what was David saying? David was say, simply saying this. Lord, I know there are things down in me that are there that I am capable of doing. Lord, I fear doing them. I don't want to do them. Lord, forgive me for what is there. But dear friend, that is all of us. You know what you are and I am? The Bible says it very well in Romans chapter 3. In verse 23 it says, For we are all sinners. All of us. We are all fallen creatures. We all have blown it in the eyes of God. You know, dear friend, I think about the story of, is told of a man and he traveled a long way. He was he wanted to see this distinguished scholar. Upon his arrival to this scholar's place, he walked into the scholar's study. He wasn't, the scholar wasn't in there, but he began to look around this, this scholar's office and he noticed from the floor to the ceiling, all around the room were just walls of books. He began to think about the books that he had read that this man had written, this scholar had written all of these books. 
This man knew a great deal about this scholar and he knew that he had traveled the world over. He knew that he had held intimate conversation with the world's wisest men, its leaders of thought, its creators of opinion. And he sat down with this scholar and here's what he said. He said, tell me if you will, after the years that you've spent in study, out of all of the things that you've learned, what is the one thing best worth knowing? Good question. Uh, this great scholar's face being flushed with emotion, he took his hands and gently placed them over the hands of the visitor. And here's what he said to him. He said, my dear sir, out of all of the things that I've learned, there are only two lessons that are, that are best worth knowing. He said, first of all, I am a great sinner. And secondly, Jesus is a greater Savior. Amen. Wow. You see, dear friend, Jesus, dear friend, He is precious because He is gracious, He is glorious, and He is a greater Savior, dear friend, than you are a sinner. Jesus is precious because He has redeemed us from our sin. He has made us new creatures in Christ, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 tells us, and He is precious. He is precious because there is no Redeemer but Jesus. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you several questions. The Bible, first of all, says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And so I'll tailor every question around that verse. And so question, what shall it profit a man if he become a great artist and yet not know Jesus, the one that is altogether lovely? What shall it profit a man if he become a great architect and yet not know Jesus who is the chief cornerstone? What shall it profit a man if he become a great baker and yet not know Jesus the living bread? What shall it profit a man if he become a great baker and yet not know Jesus the priceless possession? What shall it profit a man if he become a great biologist and yet not know Jesus who is the giver of life? What shall it profit a man if he become a great builder and yet not know Jesus, the sure foundation? What shall it profit a man if he become a great carpenter and yet not know Jesus who said, I am the door? Dear friend, what shall it profit a man if he become a great doctor and yet not know Jesus, the great physician? Are you with me? Dear friend, what shall it profit a man if he become a great educator but not know the great teacher? Jesus. What shall it profit a man if he become a great farmer but yet not yet know Jesus who is Lord of the harvest? What shall it profit a man if he become a florist but yet not know Jesus the rose of sharing? What shall it profit a man if he become a great geologist, geologist but yet not know Jesus the rock of the ages? What shall it profit a man if he become a great warrior but yet not know Jesus, the advocate. What shall it profit a man if he become a great student, but yet not know Jesus, the incarnate of truth? You see, Jesus is precious. He has no rival. Jesus is precious. Mm -hmm. Because, dear friend, he is the great redeemer. I want to tell you what, dear friend, if you one day will stand faultless before the throne of God, dear friend, you will only do that because of Jesus. Dear friend, I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that, dear friend, yes, I have been a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. Amen. He is good. Let me give you number three here. Jesus is the Redeemer. Jesus is precious, number three, because there is... No replacement for Jesus. No replacement for Jesus. <laughs> you know, last night something happened and I thought to myself, why is this happening? Lord, what do you want to do with this? And maybe it was for this reason that I tie this into this point. Last night I moved a trailer and all of a sudden I heard my wife say, dinner's ready. Oh, well, I immediately left and went and ate dinner and 
only to leave the ignition on and of my truck and leave the fan running inside the cab and the interior light on and totally forget about it over the course of the next five or six hours. Went out that night to move the truck and the battery was dead, as you know. Took a little while, jumped the truck off, got it in the garage, put the battery charger on it and charged it overnight. Getting ready to walk out this morning thinking, okay, I'll drive the truck. Oh, while I was fixing my coffee, I've got to take the battery charger off. I've got to close the hood and, you know, before I can leave and come to church this morning. Only to realize that the rear tire was flat. I thought to myself, what is this all about? <laughs> Say that want me to go to church this morning. And I literally stood there for a moment in these clothes and I thought, okay, I've jacked the truck up, pulled the tire off, put a plug in it. No, I'm not doing that. And, uh, and managed to get here. But you know what, dear friend, I started to think, okay, if the battery's ruined, I can get another battery. If I can't plug the tire and get the tire fixed, okay, I can get another tire. It's going to be okay. No big deal. Well, I want to tell you, that's what Peter's talking about here. Dear friend, when he uses this word precious, don't miss this. The word appears as a noun, but he's really using it as an adjective. In other words, we can read it this way. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Amen. You see, the word carries the meaning of, don't miss this, exceptional distinction. To the extent, here it is, here's what Peter is saying, that if Jesus is removed, replacement of Jesus is an absolute impossibility. That's what Peter is saying. All in the word precious. You see, dear friend, he is so precious and he is irreplaceable. There's no revival, no rival to Jesus. There's no redeemer but Jesus. Dear friend, if you want people saved from their sin, if you want people set free from their sin, there's only one person that can do it, and that's Jesus. He's the only redeemer. But you know what? There's no replacement for Jesus. I started thinking about it this morning. You know what? If, if I wrecked my truck, I could get another truck. You know, if the house burned down somehow, we would replace it. Friends will forsake you, but you can develop new friendships. Thank God for that. You can lose a job, but you could go get another one. Now let me pull over the park here just for a moment. I drive around town and I see these words, I see the signs, you've probably seen them. All tech is hiring. They didn't pay me. They should pay me to, to give this publicity right here. <laughs> you know what? I have an uncle. I have a cousin. I have a, 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 another cousin that works at Alltech. There are, all three of them are managers there. They tell me what a great place it is to work. We have several church members, several church folks that attend church here and they work at Alltech. And all of them tell me what a great place it is to work. Well, I had this guy come to me and this guy came to me and he said, you know what? I really need to get a job. I said, Okay. I said, well, all tech is hiring. Yeah, I, you've probably seen the sides. I mean, they're building a new plant. They need a whole lot of employees. Why don't you go and apply? It's a great place to work. A week later, I followed up with a phone call. I said, hey, did you go and apply? No. Don't you need a job? <clears throat> well, yeah, I need a job. Why didn't you apply? Well, I just haven't gotten around to it. What do you mean you haven't gotten around to it? What are you been doing? You're not working? Well, I just haven't had time. You haven't had time? You don't have kids? You're not married? You're not working? And you don't have time? Then we'll start praying right now when he gets married. And we'll start praying right now when he has kids after he gets a job. <laughs> what I started to realize very quickly is this guy's really not serious about wanting a job. And let me just tell you this, dear friend. I know if you lose your job, you can get another job. As a matter of fact, last time I spoke with Mrs. Hepler, hi, Mrs. Hepler, could you wave at me just from up here? Stick your hand up. Miss <laughs> Hepler heads up an employment agency. 
You want a job? Go see her. Last time I asked her how many job openings she had, she said she had 50 job openings with no one to fill them. That was several months ago. Let me tell you, we have a curse on us today. People don't want to work. The, the Bible has a very good prescription for that. It says if you don't work, you don't eat. You want to eat? Go to work! Get to work and be faithful! I just read statistics last week that under the new administration, America has more jobs available than people to work the jobs. Good news! You lose a job, there are a lot of other jobs that you can get. That was the point of all of that. You know, what, you know another thing that amazes me? You can lose body parts and get new body parts. There was a guy in the 30 service. He just had his entire knee replaced. Think about it. He took out his whole knee, put in a whole new knee. He walked in. I couldn't believe it. I know a lady right now that's getting ready to have her entire hip replaced. I see people running in the Olympics with our artificial legs. That's amazing. You lost both of your legs. And you're running in the Olympics. That's incredible. So you lose a body part. You lose an arm. I, I saw recently this robotic ro robotic arm. This, this person lost their arm. They had a robotic arm. They reached over and grabbed something, picked it up, and drank it, and set it back down Amen. with a robotic arm. I'm not saying try this, but I'm just saying if you lose a body part, you can find a replacement. But you know what, dear friend, let me tell you something. There is no replacement for Jesus. Amen. Seriously. There's no one that can forgive you of your sins. There's no one or nothing that can put the joy in your heart that Jesus can. Amen. Look at me just for a moment. You try to put joy in your heart through things, through people. It'll never happen. Things will satisfy you, but very temporarily. Things cannot give you the joy that Jesus says that Jesus will give you. Jesus will give you joy that overflows. And you know what that means? Dear friend, when you get around people and you're walking with Jesus and in love with Jesus and your heart is overflowing with the joy of Jesus, when you get around other people, that joy is going to come out and make contact with them. That's the kind of joy Jesus gives. And what about peace? Everybody wants peace. You're not going to find peace in this world, not in the things that this world offers, but Jesus promises peace. How about forgiveness of your sins? Who else can ditch you the forgiveness of your past and wipe your past clean and take your sin and throw it, throw your sin as far as it is from the east to the west? Only Jesus, the blood of Jesus can do that. Who else is going to represent you? Listen to me. One day when you stand before God Almighty, only Jesus can represent you well during that time. Amen. And let me ask you this. Who else can give you communication with God, the Creator of everything? Only Jesus can do that. It's only through the blood of Jesus that you can talk to God the Father. You know what, dear friend? Listen to me. Who else can look at you and say, I left everything and came to this world. I left the glories of heaven where I was adored and worshipped everywhere I went. And I came to my own creation and allowed them to hang me on a cross because I understood that I was the only way to rescue you from your sin. And I did that because I love you. 
be afraid there's no replacement for Jesus. I used to listen to a group as a teenager called the Martins. They have a song. I love the message of the song. It said, There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Do you know? No, not one. No, not one. It goes on. None else can heal all my soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. How true that is. Only Jesus. Let me tell you something. No one can take His place. No one can feel His role. No one can be to you what He can be to you. No one can do for us what Jesus does. Listen, Jesus is irreplaceable. It's no wonder Peter said, Unto you therefore which believe, He is precious. You know, can I tell you a little bit about Jesus as we wrap up this message? To His omniscience, there's no orbit. To His excellence, there's no end. To His sovereignty, there's no shoreline. To His lordship, there's no limitation. To His dominion, there is no demarcation. To His compassion, there's no circumference. To His blessing, there's no border. To His glory, there is no grave. Dear friend, He is the mightiest in majesty. He is the strongest in sovereignty. He is the ablest in, dear friend, authority. He is the choicest in constancy. He is the cheapest in capability, the greatest in generosity. And dear friend, He is the Savior of man's soul. Amen. Let us pray together. I want to ask you today two questions. First question, dear friend, do you know Jesus? Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Do you fellowship with Him? Do you talk to Him? Does He have your heart? Has He changed your life? Do you know Him? Do you know him? this Jesus that Peter said three times in just a few verses? He is precious. Jesus. The sweetest name I know. Jesus is precious. Dear friend, do you know Him? Dear friend, if you don't know Him, Jesus said it Himself. He said, you're not going to have life until you come to Me. He said it this way in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am. There's those words. I am the way, the truth, life. You know what he meant by the life? The life your heart longs for. The life your heart yearns for. The life I created you to know can only be found in myself. That's what Jesus said. I am the way. I am the way to heaven. I am the way to joy. I am the way to peace. I am the way to have your sins forgiven. And I am the truth. And John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth. You will know Jesus. And Jesus will set you free. And then Jesus said, I am the life. I am the life. Dear friend, you plug into the life and you'll have life. A life that will overflow. The life that will be the life you've always yearned for. And Jesus said, come to me and I will in no way cast you out. In no way will I reject you. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. Dear friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, would you come to Him today? Would you call upon His name to be saved? Would you come to Him today? Would you say something like this, Lord Jesus? Oh, dear friend, if this is you, would you pray something like this with me? Lord Jesus, 
Thank you for dying upon the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you love me. Lord, today I confess to you I am a sinner. Oh, God, I've blown it in so many ways. And Lord, I ask you today to save me. Cleanse me of my sin. Lord, today, head bowed and your eyes closed just for a moment. If you pray that with me, would you look at me just for a moment? Would you look me in the eye just for a moment? There are a few faces that are looking at me. I want to tell you this. For many of us, I know you've tried the goods of the world. You've tried the way in the world. I'm sure you've probably discovered like I discovered. This world cannot bring peace and joy to your heart. The devil would like to make you think so. <coughs> Dear friend, I want to tell you that joy and peace and satisfaction and contentment that you've been yearning for is only found in Jesus. If you pray today to receive the Lord Jesus, I want to encourage you to do this. This is a relationship. It's time to get to know Him. Read His love letter to you, the Bible. Start in the book of John. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the book of John. And before you read it, say, God, show me more of who you are. This is a relationship. I want to know you. And dear friend, begin the journey. If you would close your eyes just for another moment. If you prayed today to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friend, I want to tell you, get to know Jesus. I want to tell you this. Welcome to the family of God. Praise the Lord for these that Pray to receive you today, Lord Jesus. Now, Christian, I want to ask you a question. You know, today we live in a day and age where people are falling away from the church. The church is dwindling rapidly in America. People are chasing after a feel-good something. Dear friend, I have to be honest with you this morning. One of the heaviest burdens that I carry is as a pastor. He's working with people who lack heart for Jesus. You know, since I've been a believer far before I was a pastor, I certainly haven't been perfect. But the greatest struggle that I've had as a believer since I was five years old, was wanting to do more for Jesus. Understanding what He has done for me. And I just wonder today, is there a Christian here today that would say, you know what? I'm right there with you. I want to be more. Man, I want to be more for the kingdom of God. I want to make more noise for Jesus. I want to tell more people. I want to serve Him in my home. I want to serve Him at work. I want to serve Him in the church. I want to live and do more for Jesus. And I wonder if there's one here today that would say, Pastor Jay, you know what? Man, I need that fire kindled again in my heart. I need the Lord Jesus to, to, to not just build a fire, but to build a bonfire in my life that I would burn, that I would burn for the King of Kings. You know, as we close here today, I want to ask you, if God spoke to your heart today, 
If God spoke to your heart today, you know and God knows. If God spoke to your heart today, I want to ask you, will you be obedient to what He said? And it begins by right now you coming to this altar getting out of your seat and coming and getting on your knees before God Almighty. And say, God, I hear you today. You spoke to my heart today. And I come to say yes. Dear friend, would you come right now and God spoke to your heart. You say, boy, that's me. I want to do more. I I want to be more intentional in living for the Lord. I don't know how it is that God may have spoken to your heart, but He spoke to your heart. Would you come right now? Come right now. And do business with the Lord. Come right now. And do business with God. Dear God, I don't know about anybody else here today, but Lord, I just know that ever since I've known You, one of the greatest burdens of my heart has always been wanting to do more for you. God, I love you. And Lord, as I look at this world, I see a lot of lost folks. I see a lot of waywardness even in the church. People that struggle to even come and worship. People that have their priorities all mixed up. God, as much as I want to change it, I know I can't. Only you can. God, only you can speak to hearts. Only you can lead your people. God, I ask you to lead your people. I ask you to speak to hearts. And God, I do ask you that your people, oh God, people's hearts will be open. That you will open up their hearts. That you will tear down the hardness and the walls that have been built. Oh, God, you will lead your people. Oh, God, lead your people. I want to ask you today, with your head bowed, your eyes closed, if I want to pray for you this week, if you raise your hand as a yes to this question, dear friend, if God spoke to your heart today, would you slip your hand up? You know what? I want to ask you another question. I see your hands. I want to ask you this question. If you would say, Pastor, I need prayer this week, would you please pray for me? You don't need to tell me what it is. Would you raise your hand, Pastor, pray for me this week? I see your hands. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be talking to God about you. You can put your hands down. Praise the Lord. Father, you see the hands, you know the hearts, you know the need. God, I'm so thankful for your invitation in Matthew 11, 28. Will you tell us to come unto you all who are burdened and heavy laden? And God, you make us a promise that you will give us rest. Lord, I can pray for your people. But Father, they themselves need to come unto you who are burdened and heavy laden. Dear church, if you raised your hand and said, Oh, please pray. Right now, would you come to the Father? He's invited you to come. Will you come to Him right now? And say, Father, I am burdened. I am heavy laden. And I need your rest. I need your peace. I need your direction. I need your help. Would you pray this? Lord, I will not stop seeking you until you bless me. Until you give me peace. Until you give me direction. Until I see you move in this situation. Can you pray that? Can you say with me as we close, Jesus, you are precious. Jesus, you are precious. Can you say that to him? Jesus, you are precious. 
You are precious. I love you, Jesus. Brother Derek, would you stand if you would and close us in a word?